Look, building wealth can require you to take on new and creative ways to build and preserve your net worth. But did you know one of the secrets of the rich on building and preserving wealth is found in art? See, this alternative asset class is a subtle yet powerful way to grow your net worth. So in this week's episode of Making Billions, I bring on my dear friend, Maria Brito. Maria is a straight shooting New York City art curator that works with ultra high net worth collectors, as well as celebrities like Puff Daddy, Gwyneth Paltrow, and more. Join Maria and me as we discuss this asset class and how to get started building wealth within this sector. Working with professionals and being creative in your wealth building efforts are all skills we can use in our pursuit of making billions. Here we go. Welcome to another episode of Making Billions. I'm your host, Ryan Miller, and today I have my dear friend, Maria Brito. Maria is an award-winning New York-based contemporary art advisor, entrepreneur, author, and creator. She has helped the ultra-rich and celebrities, including Sean Puffy Combs and Gwyneth Paltrow, to build multi-million dollar collections in this space. So what this means is that Maria is highly skilled, not only in what art will delight investors' eyes, but will also delight their net worth, making her a highly sought-after elite player in the art curation investment space. So Maria, welcome to the show. Hi, Ryan. I'm so excited. I love you and I love the show. <laughs> well, we certainly love you too. <laughs> and I love everybody who's listening. Um, you know, high vibes. I feel great. Thank you for having me. I'm super honored and um, excited to talk to you about art collecting, art investing, and everything that relates to the things that make my heart sing. Yes. Well, it's so good to have you. And if you can tell, uh, you can see why just from that high energy, that excitement that she brings to the room, everybody's excited to work with her, myself included. We're certainly honored to have you on this show. We've gotten to know each other a little bit offline. And look, I am so impressed with what you've been able to do. That little introduction I just gave is nothing compared to everything that you've accomplished. And you're just getting started. I have a feeling that you're about to 10x everything that you've even done. But before we get into that, um, and you're going to want to hang in there at the end where she reveals a lot of her secret pointers on making and preserving wealth in the art space and just finding what you enjoy. But before we get into that, maybe you can walk us through, like, how did you even get into this, this industry? Well, I was born and raised in Venezuela, and I moved to the States to go to Harvard Law School because my parents were very conservative and adamant. So for them, art was something that you use either as a hobby something to nurture your culture and your education and to have great points of conversation with people or as a collector, but never as a career. So all the things that I really wanted to do with art as a child, because my parents really instilled in me all this love for our history. We traveled a lot. We traveled the world going to museums. For them, again, it was like, this is a hobby. Like, you know, people go for dependable careers. And so I did that. And when I moved to New York to start working as, a, as an attorney, I started also going to galleries and buying art for me as an emerging young attorney and emerging artist. And little by little, I started getting the bug myself. And so friends would come to me and say, what have you seen in the galleries in Chelsea or in Soho? And is there anything worth buying right now? So I would recommend things to them. And it was a very different world back then, Ryan, because there was no Instagram, no, basically very little to find things on the internet. The websites for these galleries was very rustic. You would have to go physically or you would have to go and subscribe to this obscure magazines where nobody understood, you know, anything. When I am in my ninth year of practicing law or eighth year, I don't know. I'm like, where am I going with this? I hate this. I was doing leverage buyouts and working, representing the banks. And I was pregnant with my first child. Being an attorney, going to Harvard and practicing in New York is a dream for many people. And the truth is, I'm super grateful for that time. There are very little trainings in life that teach you how to think the way a lawyer thinks. Someone who has to review contracts, pay attention to little details, and being also almost like on call as if you're a doctor because you have to sleep with, like at that time it was a Blackberry. We didn't have iPhones, so you had to sleep with that Blackberry under your pillow because you knew at any minute you were going to get an email from the CEO of a bank or the managing director of you know an investment bank saying, we need this now, right? And so I, I feel very privileged to have that background, and it's incredibly helpful really in what I I do, but it wasn't for me. And, you know, I, I had made, made up my mind. I mean, when I was like, you know, about to have my baby, I was like, I just really can't do this for myself because this is not for me. And, and again, like lawyers are wonderful people, but 
you know, that was not my environment. So I went back to the law firm and this was the collapse of the 2008, very similar to right now. And it was like, oh, Lehman Brothers and oh, Bear Stearns and, you know, Mary Lynch had to be sold and like, Bernie Madoff, everything was like this domino effect, but that was really not the reason why I quit. The reason why I left is because that was not for me. You know, I think that getting honest with my desires and my gifts and my passions is what has propelled me where I am today. And I just knew that it didn't really matter. I could go to another law firm. I had already worked in different law firms. I could go and work in-house as an attorney in a company. And that was just going to be more miserable after more miserable. So that's how I, I started. So that was year 2008. We are here 2023 with very similar conditions. Perhaps right now it's better. Um, I think it is. It's been an incredible journey. I've worked with incredible people. I've built amazing art collections. I've done, you know, great, fun, interesting, profound work too with incredible artists and galleries. And I have curated shows around the world. So that's in a nutshell. I hope I didn't take too much time. No, you did good. You have such a wonderful background. And and by the way, I was in New York during that time too. So uh, I think you and I spoke about that, that that was, that was an interesting time to be on Wall Street. And as you mentioned earlier, that uh, the art market was very local, right? And so people would rely on you to travel all these things and say, oh yeah, uh, in Soho or these different areas where you're seeing different galleries. And you're able to take that and decentralize it to say, how about I just bring what I see onto social media? And then that led to you working with some pretty impressive uh, people that we talked about before. Is there anything that you're allowed to share about working with the uh, high-end clients and, and what was that like working with celebrities? I had acquired knowledge while buying my very small art collection, but I wasn't an expert. So I had to go and ask questions to a lot of people. Everybody would open their doors and say, yes, I want to talk to you about my gallery or I want to talk to you about my program. I would figure out how to meet artists in their studios. I would send emails casually and say, hey, listen, I have a blog. And people, the artists said, oh, she's so cool. Let her come in, you know? And so I would share these things on Facebook and Twitter. It sort of got momentum and people started responding really well. And so I have a friend who lives in Los Angeles and her husband has worked for many years on the background of the entertainment industry the music industry. So she um, sends me a message and she said, oh, I've been uh, looking at your posts and I'm fascinated by this new career you've built for yourself and so dynamic. And I finally understand about art because of you. And thank you so much. And by the way, there is a friend of ours, especially of my husband, who's looking for a person like you. It's Sean Diddy Combs. Would you be open to an introduction? And I was like, oh shit. Yes, I am open <laughs> to that introduction. So I go and I meet with a man who was super cool, super kind him and I sat down and talked for a long, long time. And one of his concerns was that he wanted an impartial arbiter because he said, oh, look, I know a lot of these people already. I know artists. I know gallery owners. Everybody knows me. And that's the truth. I mean, he's been around since he, he's been famous since he was 20, you know, and so everybody sort of knows him. And he says, but I do want someone who's impartial and someone who can actually advocate for what I want while at the same time not selling me things that I don't want, you know, I, I want you to tell me what's worth what. I want you to tell me what's worth investing in. I want you to tell me if this should be something that I should have in my collection. And so I definitely appreciate it that moment of humbleness of someone who was already brutally famous and rich and in telling me, I don't know what I'm doing and I really need help because I want to have a really nice art collection and what I have so far is not that great. It's a, it's a long collaboration that has lasted 12 years. And, uh, we went to Art Basel together many, many times, maybe six or seven in Miami. Uh, I've been to his homes and, you know, we have worked on different strategies for different things in his collection. It's, 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 it was an incredible opportunity for me and I feel very fortunate, but not every of my clients is a collector of that caliber with that amount of money. I mean, I have other collectors who have less money, have bigger collections, and I have other collectors who they spend $100,000 a year and they have great collections too. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It, you know, we talked about this. It's not necessarily what you read on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, what the art market is. Those, those are the things that get reported to the news because the numbers are so exorbitant. People have to talk about that, but it's not what it is in general. I mean, Working with Puff, I remember that he bought once a South African artist and he paid $10,000 for something he fell in love with. And I told him, yes, this is amazing. We bought it at uh, Art Basel. It was a South African artist, a South African gallery, and it was quality. And he paid 10000 bucks. And that was, you know, at some point hanging next to something else that he had bought that was $25 million. So what I'm trying to say is that I don't want anybody to think that they are being priced out because they don't have this sort of like bucket of 
infinite cash to buy art. That is not the truth. And nobody should be priced out of collecting. Anyway, I, I took a lot of uh, tangents here. No, but... you're good. I love the point. So you, you've dispelled that myth for me as well is saying like, you actually don't have to be ultra mega rich. People get that. I, I didn't even realize that, but that was my impression is saying, no, this is a great way to grow and maintain wealth. But uh, that's one view of it. The other one is finding things that you love that spark some type of emotion, passion, whatever it is. And you see it every day when you walk through your hallway or some centerpiece in your home. And so working with you or, you know, keep in mind, like th these are in the context of investors and high net worth people that are working with you that are on the path of making billions or maybe they're already there working with you how does that work talk about a little bit of how does it work working with an art curator uh, maybe just walk us through some of the fun stuff you're up to today Look, everybody is different and my objective is to serve my clients first and foremost. So I have the greatest satisfaction with when the clients are the happiest, right? And so there are different types of clients. There is the virgin, the one who has never done anything, right? They don't know anything about the art market. And so it's a lot of my time in education and explaining things. And obviously this is a, it's a dialogue. It's a lot of questions you're going to ask. It's a lot of things that are in your head. What's what and why, right? Like, what are the art fairs that are worth going? What are the art fairs that are top, medium, uh, young? What are the museums that acquire young artists? What does it really mean when a museum acquires something? Uh, you know, what are the tax write-offs if I want to donate something to a museum, let's say, right? I mean, does that exist? Does it help me? I have had collectors who have very, very, they have very big collections, for example, and they have been able to close big financing deals using the art as a collateral, for example, that is a very unusual thing. But what I'm telling you is that this has a lot of creative angles that people use. I have this very vast amount of clients with very different conditions. People sometimes come and say, look, I want to start and I have this budget and what can we do with it and how long it'll take, you know, for me to find the right things. And it also depends, like, what are you willing to give in terms of time and attention, right? Because while it is not, I don't want to say it is a serious pursuit. If you want to do things for either the joy of collecting art or for the expansion of learning something new, you're going to have to dedicate some time, right? And that is something that you have to sort of like agree with yourself from the get-go. Some clients of mine don't ever have to meet me and come with me to things because I told you... Um, 90% of all these transactions happen online. If you do not have the desire to come everywhere with me, or if you do not live in New York, or if you are in Texas and, you know, there are only five galleries in Dallas, you will have this channel through me and you will get to see things from the comfort of your house or office on your phone or your computer. So there is not one way to do this thing. And, but it, it does for the most successful collectors, it takes a little bit of their time to understand what's happening, right? And why. But I adapt and adjust to whatever they want me to do. I mean, it's like, yeah, you want me to go and see your house and measure every wall. And it, those are things that are fine, you know? I mean, I have a team who does that, but I can do that too. It doesn't really matter. It's it's about like, what are the objectives? And, and you know, I come up with a game plan that serves the objective and, you know, successfully accomplishes it. Yeah. I love that. And, you know, working with uh, someone in your position, I imagine it. Uh, so I, I'm just looking through the lens of my own eyes where, you know, you make a few bucks and then you want to say, all right, I want to I want to put this in places. Well, I mean, are you going to buy a bunch of gold bricks, put them in your house? Or are you going to leave cash in your bank account? The other alternative is a store of value could be art. Like and then you have that just like this other guy, which is a phenomenal idea. Didn't even think of that where you can use art if you have art worth collateralizing that does have some value. You can actually use that in future as down payments for some of your financing things. But one of the things that I find most interesting is that working with an art curator like yourself or anyone in the industry, um, but if you want to work with the best, I would say go work with you. But regardless of, of who that is, one of the cool things about your industry um, for investors who are around the world is that it gives you access. And you brought this up a little bit offline, and maybe we can get your comments on this, is that you, know, you can go out and you can just look around and see how you feel, right? But you have no idea what's going on. But the cool thing that you know, the insider track is that working with an art curator to help grow your or preserve your wealth, they're able to understand that context. But the thing is, is you're working with somebody who has the inside track on, we'll say, the chatter, 
that some of the, uh, you know, around the business, around the artists, like you guys are so involved in that, that you have that inside track on the value of these assets in both. I don't care if you're buying a business, you're investing in stocks, understanding what's going on behind the scenes legally, of course, no insider trading here. Well, it's a different industry. You see, that's I love what you're saying, because in any other, you know, um, at securities industry or whatever, this will be a crime, but it's not. And I have been in this business 14 years, so I know a ton of people. There are so many things happening all the time, and that's the truth, right? I mean, it's a vast market. Not one single person can know everything. It's just way too much. You know, I've tried to weed all this sort of like the things that are not worth talking about, the things that I already know go nowhere. I am very particular about the location of the artist too, because I know that the surroundings can make or break a career. I'm trying to see the context, the information that surrounds also that particular artist to see if there is a viable growth or not. And most of the time I'm right. I mean, the new frontier is that a lot of dealers and a lot of galleries are going to Africa, like Ghana and Nigeria to find art. It's not African-American anymore. It's African-African. So they are going there because it's the new unexplored territory. And it's hot. I mean, there are articles written about this everywhere that are, you know, it's a very long trip that people are willing to do because the artists are wonderful. Many of them had had like education in London and they've returned to. And so these are great things. And it's always wonderful. Like I tell some of my clients, this artist lives in Ghana and it's frontier market. I tell them, but for people who work on Wall Street, they understand this perfectly. You know, it's not even emerging markets. It's frontier. Are you willing? Yes, I am. Let's do, let's do it. And, you know, they fall in love with the art. They fall in love with the idea that they have some th something in their collection from an artist who lives in Africa. And, you know, wow, amazing. That person could potentially become a big sensation, but it's going to be a whole lot harder than someone who lives in Brooklyn. Yeah, that's that's well said. So uh, having that inside track on the chatter, knowing where they're from, all of these things that, you know, for someone who doesn't, maybe you, you made a few bucks and you're trying to invest in art and you just find something you like, which is, it's okay, but it's a little bit risky, which I, what I think I'm hearing from you is, is you're saying, well, look, we know where they're from. We know what markets are, are on the rise. We know what artists are on the rise. We understand what makes someone a genius or not. It's so much more than just colors that you like on the wall in a gar gallery. So working with an art curator. Now, really quick, auction houses. For an investor trying to make money, preserve money, acquire and build up these assets in their lives, auction houses, are they good? Are they not good for, for people, investors? Um, auction houses are good and bad. And I think that this has to be taken seriously and as i'm telling you auction houses have a very specific mandate which is to make money auction houses do not have any interest in the career of an artist auction houses do not care about their clients that much either because they charge to buyers and sellers so that yes they do care but they don't have any loyalty to anybody in other words you know i mean it's like it's the money and that's fine every business is about money and i don't have anything against that but what i'm trying to say with this is that it's like having a real estate broker that represents buyer and seller okay so who are you representing here right i mean who, like what are, what is really the kind of background that you know it's going to make me feel that you're negotiating or that you are keeping my interests, you know, protected. So that's the first thing. Remember that auction houses will always charge this 25%. Auction houses also take the majority of the assets as a caveat emptor, meaning, look, if it's fake, we try our best to do a, a due diligence at the very beginning, but we are not going to go all the way back and check everything and see everything and like, it, you know, I mean, it, fakes are a problem. It's not necessarily the biggest problem with newer works. It's more things that are, you know, 100, 200. And so no one who's listening to this, who's going to buy art for the first time is going to try to buy a Da Vinci painting for $500 million. I don't think that's the case. But I'm just saying that, you know, in, for, in those cases, for example, to prove the authenticity of Salvatore Mundi that was bought by the Abu Dhabi family for $500 million a few years ago, the authenticity is still questioned, and we don't know because Da Vinci has been dead for 400 years. So we can't really tell no matter how many x-rays, okay, whatever. That's for another day. That's like, it sounds like a fun crime, you know, detective um, story. But yeah, auction houses for investors. I don't want to say don't. I want to say be very careful. Do not fall into the traps of, look, when there is a deal that is too, too good for it to be true, it probably is not that good. You know, I've had clients who are knowledgeable actually, and they felt that there were times, let's say 
May 2020, right? And they say, oh, people are not going to be bidding and whatnot. And like there are these this assets that they got under the value. And it's been really hard to sell them again. They've like reached out to me and say, hey, I got all this during the pandemic. I spent, let's say, $200,000 and I want to sell them at a profit. And I said, that's awesome. But the thing is that the things you bought were not that great. So that's the other thing. You can buy names that are important not everything that an important name has produced is good you know that's the other thing what you hire an advisor because not every picasso is the same not every basquiat is the same a drawing has a different value than a painting sculptures have a completely different value system so i mean look anybody can learn the same thing as if tomorrow i decide to become an investor in the stock market if I dedicate myself to spend, let's say, the hours that the market is open, so from nine to four, whatever it is, right? And then four or five hours at night, every like learning extra or whatever, I think that maybe in two or three years, I'll be excellent. You know, maybe less. I don't know. I'm very smart. I, I want to I wanna think that, right? But I don't have that time. I don't have the time to be watching CNBC and Bloomberg every minute and be on the computer looking and the phone and, you know, be on investor calls and things like that. I don't really have the time to do that. And because of that, that's not my forte. My husband does that. That's what he does. And that's why, you know, when he would want to give me opinions about what I do, he maybe has a saying and what I buy for my own collection, because he might say, I don't like that or, you know, whatever. But in the intricacies of the market, Someone who is as skilled and intuitive as my husband, who was, you know, he was a stock trader for 20 years. I mean, then he was a CEO of a fintech. I don't think he actually can understand the market the same way I do. So this is just to say that this is a full-time job and business that requires a lot of research intelligence. Intelligence meaning what you're learning and processing and it's dynamic, it's fast, it changes. And it's full of opportunities Particularly, you know, if someone just wants to go with an open heart, let's say, you know, like say, oh, okay, I, I, I do have this. And we talked about this offline, $100,000 to spend over the course of a year, let's say, you know, or forever. I don't know. I just want to have 10 nice paintings, 10,000 bucks each or whatever. Would you be able to guide me? Yes. You know, that is fun. We can do that. It's possible. Right. I mean, and, and so as I, as I said before, this is a market that has many different ways to get in. And it's not just for, you know, the, the billionaires. It's not just for Messi Arno and LVMH. It, no, he is a big part of it, but it's not his market. Nice. Okay. So that is an exciting world. And so dedicating your time, just like uh, you said, hey, in finance, which most people listen to the show, uh, in finance, yeah, if you really think about it, it's taken you decades to get good at making money in the market, whether it's hedge funds or private equity, whatever it might be. But now that, that same principle applies to the art market. So as we round third base, I'm just wondering if you had a few pointers that you can leave behind for some of our listeners who want to invest, to grow money. Why don't we start with what's, what's one myth about making money in the art market that you want to dispel for our listeners around the world? Well, I think that we touched on that and it's like, okay, I need to have billions or I need to buy the $1 million painting. That is not the case. As I said before, there are plenty of young fun artists. It's almost like, like if you are, you know, like your fund, for example, like being a venture capitalist, right? Let's say you put money on 10 companies that are starting and they are different things. And it's like, one is technology and the other one is, I don't know, fashion. And the other one is sustainability and whatnot. Right. And you put a little bit here and there and you know, you're like, okay, guys, I love you. Woo! You know, but, but, and, and so it's kind of the same in the art world. You may have, let's say, you know, this $100,000 and you want to split them equally. There are fun and interesting things that can be bought for that price. I think obviously at 20, it becomes even better quality, you know, when it starts to become like 50, 100 per, per, you know, piece, then it's got to be a little bit more serious because we're talking about more money and then you just don't want to throw your money out. You know, that are great. I, we also mentioned this, the, the hottest markets is, is, young female artists and black artists because for the longest time in art history those were categories that were not necessarily pushed or a lot of women were not really finding their footage in the art world like their foot and like they were not getting their recognition but that changed tremendously so a lot of young artists, which is a segment we call the ultra contemporary because these women are, you know, 28 to 35, are already having results at auction of million, like a million or a million two or a million five, you know, and these are things that were bought by whomever is 
selling them for maybe a hundred thousand or they were maybe, you know, 50 and things like that. I have a client who bought a painting in 2016 through me and he paid 30 and he just moved to a townhouse. So we had to go and reassess everything with insurance and he got reappraised about a million. And so, I mean, that's the type of thing that happens in the art market that there is, we always say that it beats the S and P 500 by, but like, you know, at least four times, but it's, I don't want to say it as a general blanket statement because it's not true for every art that you buy, right? And so and you have to, in a way, be extremely strategic. And the competition is brutal too. Like all the best things, you're always going to have to like fight a little bit. And that's also why working with an advisor is good because we are advocates. We are the ones who are calling and, you know, asking and please and this, and this is a great collector. We have to vouch for the collector. So, you know, it's there are a lot of interesting things that we would we can spend a lot of time talking about, but I hope that I'm giving people a glimpse of how things are in the art market and how hot it is. I mean, I think very recently the Wall Street Journal said this is the hottest market on earth. And obviously when we see recessionary times, I think people who do have the money to spend, they go for assets like art because you know, when you buy a one of a kind painting that is excellent, nobody else has it. And then therefore it's a valuable thing. You can hold it on, you know, you can hold onto it for a little bit and wait and see what happens. And I mean, traditionally art has really done well during inflation and recession. And it's not necessarily the exception right now. It's just that the last three years were absolutely massive. The, the year of the pandemic, was massive 2021 2022 were insanely big so people really bought and bought and bought and bought and i think what you're seeing right now is that people are becoming much more selective so instead of just like buying 10 paintings a month they may maybe they're buying one that's kind of like what i am seeing and my colleagues are seeing too i mean so there's a bit of a shift in the market and you're seeing that in a lot of asset categories and yours is certainly one of them you know so it sounds like from what you said just to synthesize the myth is you don't have to be a billionaire. You can get started. I think you said ten thousand dollars. Like you can get you can get a nice, valuable painting for ten thousand dollars. Now that being said, I gotta ask, who are some of those artists uh, for people starting out? And and it's not just art lovers. I mean, to some degree, but also people who are love art but also want to invest. They see it as an asset class that's very important to them as in their overall building of wealth and making billions. Maybe if you could share, say, three artists or so that that are really solid uh, investments. I'm not going to talk about young artists in like that category of like the 10,000s and whatnot, because all of those things are unproven. It's just us taking bets, right? But let's let's say, for example, George Kondo is an artist whose paintings, and it has that's the other thing, it has to be from the Cubist series, because he made a lot of different series. So the Cubist series usually has annualized rate of return, maybe of like 50%. I mean, it's like really crazy. I have friends who spend days doing these algorithm things and calculations that I would not even know how to do, but they get the data and they actually crunch those numbers. So George Kondo, who is in his sixties and lives in New York, is a wonderful draftsman and he's a great painter and he is represented by one of the best galleries in the world and has had many museum shows. And it's a guy who, you know, has that background, that growth of the pop era and the minimalist era. And so he comes with his own language. People love him. He does really well. Then there is Alex Katz. We talked about Alex. Alex is 95 years old, also a New Yorker, and he paints figures and landscapes. If you're ever going to buy anything from Katz, make sure it is a figure. He paints women. Don't buy men. (laughs) He paints men too. Don't buy the men. Buy the women. Buy the paintings. He just had a very well-received retrospective at the Guggenheim Museum here in New York. Before that, he had a, like three months prior, he had had another one at the Thyssen Museum in Madrid. He is beloved. And like, honestly, at 95, I mean, I don't want to predict his demise, but like, you know, how much longer can he go, right? I mean, he could, especially if you can never get one of the young, like this, 1970s or 1980s paintings those are the ones that are the most valuable because it was the beginning not not the beginning but a moment in his career where he was really refining his skills and a dead artist that everybody knows and loves is Andy Warhol the most valuable asset for the most part in any art market conversation is a painting it's a -a one-of-a-kind painting right but Warhol did hundreds of paintings and thousands and thousands of prints so Print is something that I, you know, a lithograph, uh, you know, a screen print is something that I would recommend to someone who's really young and says, oh, I have no money 
I have 2000 bucks. What do I do? Go buy a print for fun, you know, but the Warhol prints are sui generis and they are solid. And particularly the Marilyn prints, he did all this Marilyn prints in different combinations have shown an insane growth consistently. And there are thousands of those Marilyn prints out in the market because he made, I don't know, I, I always forget, forget the number, but let's say it's like 2,600. I don't know. They range from, you can still maybe get one at auction for maybe a hundred thousand or 120,000 and they go all the way to 600,000 and whomever, and whomever has kept, because the way Warhol intended this was a portfolio of, I don't know if it was 10 or 12 of all the Marilyn's in different combinations, right? Whomever has that portfolio intact has been able to see even $2 million for those things, you know? So, I mean, that's the type of print that I would say, if you can get a Warhol Marilyn, or even maybe not on Marilyn, but maybe you like a Liz, you know, like he did a Liz Taylor or like maybe Campbell's Soup or whatever. It's a super insanely solid market. So, but go for the Marilyn's because I'm telling you, I myself, some of my clients ask me for Marilyn's and either the ones I find are way too expensive and above what they want to like spend or like we get out bid all the time. I see it's a really hot market and it will continue to be because that's it. There are no more prints and Warhol's been dead for many years and he's the kind of artist that is relevant forever. I mean, at least in our lifetimes, it's very hard to take away from all the things that he did. Man, that that is brilliant. I absolutely love that. So maybe last pointer. So we've talked about, we've talked about many things. You can get started with less money than you think. You don't have to be a billionaire to build wealth in this sector. There's some great artists in this sector if you're just starting out. Now, for those people who, again, are continuing to, as you talked about your husband, who put in all the time as much as you did to understand uh, both of your crafts, for somebody who really wants to understand this, well, the easiest way would be work with you or you know someone in your field. But what, for those that just want to understand it, uh, if they're like me, they're just saying, I'll probably work with you, but I at least want to understand what I'm talking about before I work with you. What advice could you give to people just to build skills and spotting great pieces? I think you should subscribe to Artnet News, okay. which is wonderful. It's, it's a twice a day newsletter that gives you what's happening, you know, the overall pulse of the market, ideas, new artists, collectors. It's a it's a mix of everything. And so it's, it gives you a nice angle of what's happening in everywhere, like the auction houses, the museums, the collectors, the galleries and whatnot. So that's great. I also think that because all the data from the auctions is available on their websites of Christie's and Sotheby's, at least, I mean, there are many more auction, auction houses in the United States, you know, many, many more and in the world. But if you just want to have an idea of prices, what things sold for, estimates, etc., you can go to Christie's.com and Sotheby's.com and Phillips, which is the other one. Bonham's is another one that is also big and, and respected and see and get a feel for the prices, right? And, and there are categories. There is like, and it, this, this auction houses have sales, as I said before, their number one mandate is to make money, but they have, they have auctions in person in May and November and the rest of the year, it's all online. It's anybody can register and bid if they want to. I mean, remember all the caveats I already gave you, but you can also have the information for free. You do still have to register to see all the numbers uh, for the most part. I don't know if, I know that probably Phillips is still not, you don't need to register, but in the other ones you will. Worst thing that can happen is that you get an email from them and that's it and you can unsubscribe. But I think that knowledge is power. And if you are curious, that is kind of the only place where you do have all this information, you know, without having to pay for like a database that, you know, paying 500 bucks a month, or you don't need to do that. You know, it's, it's like, you can go and have a feel. And I mean, that's all the things that I can think people can do from their couches, right? I mean, if you want to go and do the real lit work, go and visit galleries and ask questions and ask for prices or go to art fairs. Art fairs are places where you can find, I find that for the uninitiated, an art fair could be very overwhelming because they are usually really big with a ton of things to see. So they can be overwhelming and they can be exhausting. But if you are, you know, oh my God, I'm going to go to Miami in December and you want to go to Art Basel the week that it opens and, you know, I mean, whatever. Then you go and you ask questions and you ask for prices and you shake hands. I mean, like I said before, there are, there are no real rules on how to approach this business, but to be able to cover it and to strategize about it, it's a full-time job. I have friends who are collectors who have retired 
and their full-time job is to do what I do, but they do it for themselves. And they spend their years traveling to art fairs all over the world and visiting, you know, museums and collect, and it's their passion. And, you know, they decide what to do and what to buy based on their first hand observations of the market because they don't do anything else. Awesome. Yeah. Phenomenal. So as, as we wrap things up, final comments, is there anything else you'd like our fans to know, like how to connect with you, maybe your Instagram handle, how to follow you? I mean, you, I follow you. So I've seen, I all, follow the you cool, too. <laughs> yeah, I've seen all the cool stuff that you post on there. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, but how can people connect with you uh, after the show? Yes. Well, my website is Maria Brito, B-R-I-T as in Tom O dot com. And that has all the li different little, you know, I can connections to my social media and my Instagram is Maria Brito underscore NY for New York. And uh, also my website has a form. So if anybody wants to email me and get in touch with me, that form is there. It's the easiest thing to do. I would be thrilled to hear from you guys. I'm happy to also, you know, like I always give people, oh, you want to go on Zoom and we can have a one hour talk about what you want to do. You know, we can do that. I'm very flexible and very excited to connect with new people. Yeah, I love it. And uh, it's certainly been an honor to connect with you. I feel like you and I aren't done here. So I, I might uh, <laughs> give you a call when I'm when uh, I'm ready here very soon. So just to synthesize everything that we talked about, work with art curators to get the inside track on the variables that affect the value of your investment. If you see it as an investment, but also one that you fall in love with, that you can see it every day, it's not this stock that's held by your broker. It's something that's hanging in your office or somewhere that you fall in love in your kitchen that draws inspiration, allows you to connect to the artist and connect to something greater than yourself. Work with an art dealer that understands how to get you that, how to understand the variables. To synthesize, don't start with a billion dollars. You can actually get started today. You can work with 10 grand. 10 grand can get you started in building your collection and building your wealth in this area. And finally, follow Maria on Instagram. It's wonderful. I do it. I highly recommend it. She has wonderful posts showing art galleries and different ideas and everything, even from your culture, you're sharing stuff I was learning, all kinds of things from you on uh, off of that. You know, following people, following the experts, on Instagram, getting started with where you're at now and building from there and working with professionals who can give you the inside track or all critical skills we need in our pursuit of making billions.